Thank you very much, John. And uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the conference and this um, first session. Uh, my name is Naomi Fulop. I'm Professor of Healthcare Organisation and Management at UCL and one of the co-directors of NIHR uh, Reset, one of two national rapid evaluation teams. So I'm very pleased to be uh, chairing this opening session on how COVID-19 has affected the demand and supply of rapid evaluations. Um, as everyone um, watching, listening is aware and has experiences, it has experienced, we've seen this huge and extremely rapid response from the scientific and research communities to the pandemic. Um, as well as fundamentally, a fundamental and equally rapid changes to the way healthcare is delivered. And both of these raise important issues for rapid evaluation. In terms of research and science and evidence, while the focus has understandably been on rapid research in diagnostics, treatments, and of course, vaccines, the processes which have supported these may have uh, wider lessons for other kinds of rapid research. And there's also been a huge uh, increase in demand for rapid research on, for example, the social impacts of the pandemic, uh, as well as changes to healthcare delivery systems. So what we'd like to reflect on uh, in this session is what's happened in the last year um, in relation to research and evaluation uh, and evidence and try to draw out, uh, if it's possible, the lessons um, for both uh, commissioning, um, commissioning those um, rapid evaluations and for conducting them more generally. So is it possible uh, to generalise and how can we generalise uh, from the COVID-19 experience for rapid evaluations moving forward? And we've got uh, three stellar speakers for you in this, in this session. Um, first of all, we have um, Trish Greenhalge, who is Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences at the University of Oxford. Mike Batley, who is Deputy Director of the Research Programmes Branch, Department of Health and Social Care and Head of um, NIHR Programmes. Um, and Professor Judith Smith, um, who's Director of the Health Services Management Centre at the University of Birmingham. Um, and uh, director of the BRACE Rapid Evaluation Centre, uh, the other team funded by um, NIHR. So how we're going to run this is that um, Trish isn't able to be with us in, uh, in person or live um, this morning as um, she has a family funeral. However, she's very kindly pre-recorded her presentation uh, and we'll hear, that, um, we'll hear that first. And then I'll go to Mike, and then Judith uh, to reflect on um, their experiences um, over the last uh, 10 months. Um, Mike as a commissioner of a wide range of uh, research, uh, including the diagnostic treatments and, and vaccines uh, we, we've already, we've mentioned, and uh, Judith um, as a researcher. And then we'll go to, um, to Q&A. And just a reminder, that uh, you can ask questions at any time through the chat box on the live stream page. And um, please do that. Please enter your uh, questions and um, comments there. So I'd now like uh, to turn to um, uh, Trish Greenhouse's pre-record and I hope that will play now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Trish Greenhouse. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to give the opening talk at your conference on rapid evaluation. I'm very sorry I can't be with you live in person. You may have heard I've got a family funeral today. Uh, I'm going to talk about rapid evaluation in the COVID-19 era towards a cult of the imperfect. And I'd like to dedicate this short talk to the memory of all who've lost their lives to COVID-19. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my funders who are listed at the bottom of this slide. Now, this book on crisis management uh, defines a crisis as characterised by three things, uncertainty, urgency and threat. And I think we all agree probably that, that this time a year ago, we were heading for a crisis and uh, COVID-19 soon became a crisis for all of us. And the thing about crises is that you don't have much time 
you've really got to compromise. We all know that. Um, John Appleby uh, introduced me to the work of Robert Watson Watt. Uh, he was a World War II scientist and he he coined the, the term, the cult of the imperfect. He said, give them the third best to go on with because the second best comes too late and the best never comes. Uh, I'd also like to quote my dear departed mother, who, uh, whose version of this was that some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Now, if I was going to put COVID-19 on one slide, here's what happened. Just about a year ago, roughly today, uh, a crisis uh, was declared or, or, or was soon to be declared. And soon after that, the red tape was cut, the red tape for research and evaluation and science and much else, actually, much of service delivery uh, was freed of the usual processes and procedures. Research progressed at unprecedented pace and scale. Too little knowledge quickly became too much. And then something really strange happened. Facts, or some of them at least, became contested and saturated with ideology. And uncertainty in some situations became a weapon to be used tactically by interest groups. Scientists found that the truth doesn't sit separately from politics and lobbying. I can illustrate this with an example uh, from the mask debate. Many of you will know that I, I was quite active early on uh, in campaigning for the wearing of masks by the lay public during the crisis. We wrote this paper actually in March. It was published in early April. And the, the dilemma there was, should we wait for perfect randomised controlled trial evidence or should we use common sense? basic scientific principles via what's known as mechanistic evidence, all sorts of rather indirect evidence but that perhaps that, that pulls together a story of what uh, is probably happening scientifically. And the precautionary principle, let's act now even before we've got uh, full scientific evidence because not to do so might cause uh, more harm. Now, these positions, roughly speaking, and this is very broad brush, um, became polarised between uh, what might be called the evidence-based medicine community, who had their hierarchy of evidence with RCTs at the top. You'll not know this, most of you. Um, they said, let's wait for those RCTs because masks could be harmful. And then the alternative voice, pragmatic public health, uh, who were saying, look, it's obvious, nobody's died from wearing a mask and look at the countries that mask, they've got lower death rates. This isn't perfect evidence, but for goodness sake, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty obvious, said the pragmatic public health people. Now, these facts in inverted commas quickly became politicized. Here's President Trump's COVID-19 advisor, Scott Atlas in September, 2020, who quotes three sources to support the argument that we shouldn't wear masks, which of course was a libertarian uh, view, closely aligned with the Republican Party. Uh, he's quoting uh, Carl Hennigan from the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, also the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So very authoritative sources. Uh, it didn't stop Twitter from removing this tweet as fake news, uh, because actually Twitter was more persuaded by the pragmatic arguments uh, and wasn't really persuaded by the let's wait for perfect science. Well, that's a quick uh, example. And now I want to, to take you briefly into some theoretical principles. Look, uh, Jill Russell and I wrote this paper more than 10 years ago now. Uh, why do evaluations fail? We were talking about e-health programs, but, but more generally, why do evaluations in complex, fast moving real world situations fail? And we put forward the argument that science, measurement, evaluation, don't occur in a social and political vacuum. Rather, they are inevitably constrained by both practicalities and politics. We, in turn, were drawing on the work of Barry MacDonald, uh, which was written up more recently by Savile Kushner uh, in the Sage Encyclopedia of Evaluation. Uh, and Barry MacDonald had introduced three types of evaluation, bureaucratic evaluation, uh, where uh, often perhaps management consultancies, for example, and they're not all bad. Uh, there's probably many of them listening today, but, but, uh, but in, in, in the worst case scenario, the bureaucratic evaluation government pays a consultancy to tell it what it wants to hear. 
the quality is judged in terms of how satisfied, how satisfied it is with the message. And the message is published by government who reserve the right to censor and adjust uh, what is given to them. Now, none of us want that. Nobody listening to this talk today, I'm sure, uh, is, is keen on that. Uh, but, it, but it does exist, as we all know. What is generally seen as the antidote to that is what, what MacDonald called autocratic evaluation or, or sometimes scientific evaluation in which evaluators negotiate independence to work objectively of government. The quality of this uh, kind of evaluation is measured in terms of scientific rigour. And this kind of evaluation is published both in academic journals and other scientific outlets, and also as a government endorsed report, but one that you might be prepared to trust. But then, said MacDonald, and, and, and this, is, this is the important one I want to get across to you, there is another kind of evaluation which is very important, democratic evaluation, an evaluation that recognises that it is, it is inherently about things like power and voice and influence. It's not just about scientific measurement. In democratic evaluation, the evaluators commit to provide a service, service to society, not just to the people who are paying for it, but also to those whose voices are relevant in the evaluation. And, and, and if we think about COVID, perhaps uh, one of the uh, important examples here is the Black Lives Matter movement, the voices of uh, the underserved, the uh, healthcare workers in low status occupations, for example, the porters and the cleaners who were getting COVID. Wait a minute, were, were, was their voice heard? Were they being measured? Why were they getting less good PPE than the doctors, for example? All those kind of things. Now, with this kind of evaluation, quality is not measured just in terms of the scientific quality, but also in terms of inclusivity, fair representation, the quality of dialogue that can be struck and brokered by the evaluators between the, the seldom heard groups and perhaps the, uh, the powerful groups, and also confidentiality, protecting your sources. Uh, yes, if you tell me what's going on, I will make sure that you don't suffer for it. Now, this kind of evaluation uh, is published usually in multiple formats, perhaps in multiple languages uh, for different audiences who might use it for different purposes. So bureaucratic, autocratic and democratic. And these are a good conceptual framework when we're talking about evaluation in turbulent times. Another kind of evaluation that I, I want you to bear in mind uh, when you're uh, taking this uh, conference forward, there's lots of different discussions I know uh, over the next uh, few hours and days. Uh, I very much like the work of Michael Quinn Patton on utilization focused evaluation. This is a very, very scholarly book. It's a very academic book. And it's, as you can see, it's in its fourth edition. Um, Patton is, 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 is a guru of evaluation, uh, particularly in the United States. And, and one of his uh, um, views is that evaluation should be judged, not just by the science in it, but by its usefulness to its intended users. And the first question you need to ask and maintain in your mind as you're doing an evaluation is who's going to use this evaluation and for what purpose? And again, not just the people who are paying for it, but who else might use the evaluation. Uh, another example perhaps is, is the long COVID debate where uh, the People with long COVID are saying, please count us. You're, you're underestimating the prevalence of this uh, long term complication. So it's not just the people who are paying to evaluate what's going on. It's also the patients and the people with that condition as well. And so the guiding question says, what kind of evaluation should we do? What kind of measurements should we make? How should we present the data in order for this to be useful uh, to the people who are going to use our findings? Now, utilization focused evaluation, as I say, is a very academically based, uh, very theoretically rich uh, approach, but it has been, if you like, popularized and pragmatized 
through this group called betterevaluation.org. I, I don't work for them. I, I don't know shares in or anything like that, but they've produced something called the Rainbow Framework, which uh, seeks to build a, a rich, evolving picture of what's going on using both qualitative and quantitative data, but with the added benefit of being very open and reflexive about who is sponsoring the evaluation and whose voices need to be heard and pulled out. And you can see, I'm not going to tell you about this in any detail, but you might want to look it up. You can Google Rainbow Framework Evaluation. You'll, you'll get this web page up. Uh, it's partly about setting up uh, a proper uh, governance process for managing and overseeing the evaluation, defining what you're going to do and framing it. And then the de describe phase, which I've pulled out here, um, all kinds of different methodologies and approaches, which you'll, uh, many of you be familiar with. Uh, but then also looking at how we pull that together to understand the causes of what's going on uh, and synthesize report and support the use of the evaluation. Um, so let me now take you into uh, perhaps a challenging slide. Don't worry if you can't follow this, but for those who, who are keen on theoretical approaches, We've got two paradigms here, haven't we? We've got conventional scientific paradigm and then a more critical interpretivist paradigm. The conventional paradigm, which frankly doesn't work too well in rapid evaluations, I'm not sure it works particularly well in slow ones either, uh, favours quasi-experimental designs, perhaps um, step wedged or randomised trials. It emphasizes methodological robustness, it values objectivity and disengagement, and it seeks to resolve ambiguity and get that single, more or less universal truth that is out there. It takes reality as a given. It wants to measure the effect size of something, for example. Do masks work? Um, the critical interpretivist paradigm is more naturalistic, more real world, more pragmatic. It values reflexivity and engagement. It seeks to produce a meaningful account of a particular set of actors in a particular context. And it views ambiguity and contestation as data. And finally, this approach to evaluation questions reality, especially power relations and taken for granted assumptions. So I'm going to leave you with five simple rules uh, for evaluating in a complex system in uh, this uncertain COVID-19 era. And this is a short paper I published with Harry Rutter and Miranda Wolpert in the British Medical Journal a few months ago. And the simple rules are these. Firstly, that most data are going to be flawed or incomplete. Be honest and transparent about this. Secondly, that for some questions, certainty may never be reached. We need to consider carefully whether to wait for definitive evidence or act on the evidence we have. Thirdly, acknowledge complexity. And if we acknowledge complexity, uh, we have to admit ignorance. We have to admit that we don't know and we may never know all the answers. We will identify paradoxes and we need to explore those paradoxes and reflect collectively on those and end up doing what my mother used to call muddling through. It's OK to do that. We need indeed to draw productively on dissent and disagreement to generate multifaceted solutions. Uh, and the uh, Belgian philosopher Chantal Mouffe has written a, a wonderful book on uh, agonistic pluralism, on how to productively harness uh, the conflicts between stakeholders uh, in evaluations. Uh, and finally, we need to do pragmatic studies in real world situations, not to replace uh, controlled experiments, but to complement the findings from those uh, as uh, the crisis unfolds. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of this conference. And once again, uh, I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person. Thank you very much, Trish, uh, in your absence for setting up this session so well. And as usual, with some challenging propositions uh, for us to, to reflect on. Um, we will now uh, turn to our two other speakers. Uh, before I do that, just a reminder, um, please do enter your questions um, on, on the platform 
uh, and we will uh, come to those um, as soon as you've you've entered those. So I'd now uh, like to um, turn, uh, first of all, to Mike Batley, who's head of NIHR programs, um, to um, share his reflections on how this past 10 months year has been for him in his role as a, a commissioner of, of research and um, some issues that he would like to raise. Over to you, Mike. Uh Thanks, Naomi, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. So I feel I've already learned quite a bit, madly taking down notes, listening to Trisha's presentation. Um, so I was going to start talking really a bit about um, some experience over the last uh, 12 months or so as a research commissioner and funder, generally before coming down onto, onto evaluation. And I was just looking at my diary 12 months ago, and it was full of meetings on this thing called NCOV, this as yet not officially named thing that was um, very worrying uh, at the time and um, lots of discussions in there with other funders to get our first call launched uh, in this area. I think it was about the 4th of February last year, It was a very, very long time ago. Um, and that was a, a call that um, was a bit slightly odd from a commissioner's perspective and that normally we're trying to boil things down and be quite clear about what we're asking for uh, but on this one it was genuinely how do we give a little bit of focus but actually things were so unknown then that we really wanted to cast the net wide in terms of bringing in ideas for for research and um, as part of that call we ran jointly between NIHR and, and UKRI um, we did fund quite a bit on, uh, as Naomi says, vaccines, uh, therapeutics and diagnostics. That was a real focus early on and, and still continues to be. Um, and I think we haven't done too badly uh, in that regard. In a, part of that call, we funded uh, a really interesting looking uh, vaccine uh, from Oxford University um, that's done rather well since. We're, uh, we uh, funded the recovery trial, um, platform trial. I think it's the only trial globally to actually uh, have some really strong findings on um, therapeutics. Uh, we funded principal trial, which is a, a community-based trial, but a range of different pieces of the work were funded from there. Um, and we continued to, again, keep a relatively broad approach in terms of our uh, research funding calls over the following months. Although, again, with a, something of a focus, particularly on vaccines, uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, basics around things like transmission. Uh, you know, this is something I keep reminding uh, ministers and others that we knew nothing about 12 months ago. So you know, the learning curve has been incredibly steep. Um, alongside this, uh, we know that from generally from uh, experience of other uh, similar situations, that uh, one of the real challenges for the research system is everybody really wants to help out and everybody has absolutely the right incentives and right uh, uh, drives to, to help. Um, but we can sometimes end up with a vast amount of activity, but very little in terms of definitive findings or completed studies. And again, that's what we've seen globally, uh, not least in the US. Whereas in the UK, uh, we decided to take a really quite firm approach to this with uh, the introduction of um, urgent public health uh, status for studies, which people may be aware of, and this is essentially where we uh, prioritised a relatively small number of studies, I think it's around 60 or 70 at the moment, for support from our clinical research networks, and that we want the system to support uh, generally, or to prioritise the support, um, and that's really helped uh, focus the work on res the research um, across the UK on COVID, and again has helped uh, with those some of those definitive findings. This has broadened out over time. Um, we started adding in things like uh, mental health, as we were concerned around uh, impacts on mental health. Uh, we added in uh, some calls around uh, uh, minority, uh, ethnic minority groups and what research we need there. Uh, we've done some more recently on long COVID. Uh, we have various additional vaccine studies now, so as well as running lots of vaccine trials. Uh, unsurprisingly, we're also very interested in things like trial intervals um, the impact of vaccination on whether someone can continue to spread COVID or not, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, again, still a huge number of priorities that we're, that we're working through um, at national level and trying to uh, meet the needs of uh, policymakers, clinicians and others. Um, at the same time as all of this going on, uh, we had some very rapid and pretty fundamental reorganisations of how we're delivering health services both for COVID and non-COVID services. 
um, right across the right across the, the country. And um, it was great to see that we have some some of our rapid evaluation functions that we already had set up in NIHR um, did step up to to really help out evaluate some of these changes. But two rapid evaluation systems set up for peacetime um, against a whole system uh, nationally being reorganised uh, was possibly a bit too big an ask for them to, to do all of that. Um, and so, again, it was good to see uh, people like the NHR ARCs uh, working locally to help, uh, help help with the sort of redesign of services, but also uh, help with the evaluation of services. So we have seen quite a bit of local evaluation going on. Bit of a mixed picture across the country, but some some very good work there. And of course, with the beneficial changes network that people may be aware of, uh, we're now trying to pull together some of the key learning from that work across the arcs um, on uh, what would be most useful, how we can take some of that local learning and then pull it and apply it nationally, which I think is going to be some uh, big questions we have we have at the moment. Um, so this has left me with a, a, a few questions and, and thoughts about actually where we do need to, to head in future. Um, there's an obvious one around um, how we prepare for future crises. Um, people are arguing that COVID wasn't disease X, it was a dress rehearsal for disease X, so we can't completely uh, relax, unsurprisingly. Um, and uh, actually how we prepare more broadly in the system for future crises um, is something we're looking at. So you know, we had a number of sleeping contracts, uh, mostly designed around future flu pandemics that could be uh, ramped up quickly. They have been useful, although actually the examples we tend to point out, are things like the recovery trial, um, that was set up very quickly, designed to be deliberately quite simple, designed to be delivered as part of standard of care, so it didn't need a huge amount of additional uh, research support in there and could be rolled out right across the, the country. So definitely some examples there around um, the extent to which we really want to try and predefine and get some sleeping things ready versus how we make sure that we have the flexibility in the system to, to react when we need to. Um, I think there's a, the whole question of national versus local priorities and translatability or transferability of findings as well. Again, lots of really great local practice, but how can we pull out what the national priorities are, particularly around, around service evaluation and what can be used there? And again, what can genuinely be um, shared? And then I suppose the, the final point I'm going to make is this is, we've just come through a spending review at central government. So having our budget set for a little while in the future, and actually, evaluation was a really core part of that spending review. We had a very, very strong push and a very strong drive from the Treasury to say any new policies, any major new policies, we need to see your evaluation plans. We need to understand exactly how you're going to be doing this. Um, and that's everything from sort of functional and process evaluation right the way through to longer term summative evaluation. Um, and so this is something that, again, we're very interested in generally from a sort of central government perspective too. But I think I'll, I'll stop there. That's uh, great, Mike. Um, can I just ask you, um, thinking back over the last 10, 12 months, um, if you've had time to reflect at all, um, are there things that you might do differently um, if you had that time uh, over again? Um, certainly, <laughs> many, many things. I mean, I think some of the, the big things is a system we probably got right in terms of things like some of the urgent prioritisation. It, it wasn't popular, particularly for people whose studies weren't prioritised, um, but it made a, a huge difference. Um, Certainly on the, the service delivery side of things, um, I do wonder, so to some extent, I think we relied on having a flexible system and having the infrastructure there already to help design and evaluate what's going on. And again, I wonder if there was more that we could have done to, um, again, bring in some more rapid learning from that and deploy that um, nationally more rapidly. Um, Having said that, um, I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to, um, I think what some academic colleagues refer to as the, the upcoming witch trials of um, public accounts committees and where we'll be absolutely raking over everything we've done over the last 12 months, pulling it apart and um, seeing what we can learn from that, I suppose, is a positive interpretation of, of the way these things are going to be. That will provide very interesting learning, I'm sure. 
Uh, we've had uh, one comment, uh, interestingly, from Lindsay Hubbard at NHS E&I, NHS England um, Improvement, uh, who says we also need to ask upfront whose interest does the research evaluation serve? Um, how, how would you respond to that and how um, might we more rapidly um, expand um, the um, stakeholders the end users and particularly I'm thinking of patients and the public um, in rapid evaluation, rapid research, that their interests are taken into account? Um, in some respects, I mean, the, 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 the need to involve end users is always a kind of an, it always surprises me that it's something we have to, we have to mention because certainly, so part of my role is, is policy research and it's very much around how we make sure that Policy, well, not just policymakers, plus anyone else who might actually use researchers' views are actually taken account of. So for me, it shouldn't it shouldn't even be a question. You know, it, it should be a, almost the first questions that's asked. How do we how do we do this? Um, I guess this all happens before the evaluation itself happens. So it's how the evaluators are sort of linked into the broader system. So you would almost hope that um, in terms of determining what evaluation priorities might be that would already come from a strong network of people, uh, whether it is everything from patient groups through to through to commissioners and sort of everyone in between, um, to make sure that there's sort of an ongoing process, there's an ongoing dialogue um, that really helps inform this, rather than a sort of a specific, well, we want to evaluate this, therefore who do we need to speak to kind of um, approach. And before I turn to Judith, there's a question coming in for you specifically, Mike. It's um, what are your thoughts on the skills, capability, capacity across the NHS to engage in robust evaluation? Um, gosh, um, I think uh, as with everything, uh, there's some great work going on, but I'm sure we could do a lot more. Um, and I, I think one of the, again, one of the things that really brings one of the lessons that really comes home in a in a crisis is actually you know almost what is your reservoir of expertise when you suddenly have to call on it at scale uh, with very short notice and um so i think yeah one of the things we're really going to have to look at is actually what is almost our peacetime reservoir of that ability uh and capability across the system is it enough in regular times not just uh, in times of crisis um, and I suspect the answer is going to be there's an awful lot more we need to do. Mm -hmm. There's some great work there, but there is will be more that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'd like to turn now to um, Judith Smith, um, who is director of the NHR Brace Rapid Evaluation Centre. Um, Judith, great if you could reflect on how's it been for you this last year um, as a as a researcher and um, particularly um, in relation to uh, rapid evaluation in these times. Oh, uh, thank you, Naomi. And uh, thank you also, Mike, for your reflections. Um, Mike, you de described um, the two rapid evaluation teams as having been established in peacetime. And uh, I guess then we, we moved into the, the time of war. Um, and uh, I was reflecting, as you said that, on the fact that I think uh, when we were established as rapid evaluation teams, reset and brace, I think sometimes we felt as though we're a bit uh, edgy, even a bit far out for the uh, some of the traditional, more traditional health services research community. But it's felt as though during the, um, the pandemic in particular, it's been very much as Trish described, I think, that we've been carrying out evaluation in turbulent times, and uh, hence, I think we feel um, we've moved in a sense much more centre stage with a much more, I think, right, rightly so, interest in working rapidly, but also rigorously. And from just reflecting on Trisha's presentation for a moment, a comment that really resonated with me was the one from her mum, the one about that people can be so heavenly minded that they... That, um, that they're no earthly good. And I think for me behind that comment is that risk of the, the perfect being the enemy of the good. And I think as researchers, we can sometimes fall victim to that. It's right that we have perfectionist tendencies. It's right that our work is really rigorously reviewed and that we take a lot of time 
um, often and perhaps perhaps more so in peacetime to um, ensure that we've got uh, got things uh, as close to perfect as possible. But I think again, what Trish was saying was really emphasising the importance of pragmatism and taking account of politics and different voices and changing situations, but bringing really robust theoretical methodological work to bear in those situations and to provide the evidence and evaluation insights that are really needed at a time like that. So I'm just going to, um, uh, responding to your, your question, Naomi, I'm just going to say just a little bit about how within the race, which is Birmingham, Rand and Cambridge uh, Evaluation Centre, how we've um, sort of adapted and responded in terms of our portfolio of work. And then I'll conclude with a few lessons that I think we've learned about undertaking uh, rapid work at a time like this. So just in terms of our portfolio of evaluation studies, um, first of all, we, we've taken on very rapid new work. And we're going to be hearing later this morning about the work on remote monitoring of people with COVID symptoms at home using pulse oximetry as a study that's been undertaken across the two evaluation teams and work that's continuing now to start to explore the impact of that in both health and indeed uh, likely also social care settings. So that was a case of, yes, really quickly responding, taking on new work, scoping it rapidly, getting underway um, and uh, undertaking it in a manner that's been able to really influence policy and most importantly, practice. There are other studies that were underway already where we were able to continue with them, but also needing to adapt them methodologically, perhaps undertake interviews and work uh, in remote forms, but also to find out, for example, a study we were doing of primary care networks in England, find out how they were responding to the uh, pandemic, uh, the role they were playing, and to write up that as part of, of the findings. And another example would be work we're doing on mental health, trailblazer uh, pilots, work we're doing in the Brace Centre along with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. There, that's about mental health support for schools. Of course, that's become even more significant and relevant in these incredibly troubled times. So again, adapting for that. And also then enduring work about uh, people with uh, long-term complex conditions, inequalities and so forth, that continues through and clearly will continue through into the, um, the emergence from the pandemic and the post-pandemic response, as, as Mike was referring to. So I think um, those are all important parts of how we've worked. Just to conclude with sort of what we've learned about undertaking rapid evaluation, partly over the almost three years we've been a rapid evaluation team, but particularly over this, this past year, my first lesson would be, you can't skimp on scoping. I think working out what are the questions that really need answering about this particular issue. So whether it's about remote monitoring at home, whether it's about primary care networks, whether it's about mental health and young people, you've got to, you've got to spend time on that. And secondly, that has to be done with the users, the users that we were just being asked about, whether that's the policy makers, healthcare practitioners and with some members of the public and some service users. You have to do that in a collaborative way. You have to do it rapidly, but you have to do it collaboratively. Thirdly, I think we've all learned, and Mike, I think, was reflecting on this, we can streamline our processes if we really put our minds to it as funders, as health service practitioners, as researchers. We can sort out a lot of the red tape and bureaucracy that to some extent we've all got culturally used to. We can cut through it when, when we need to. Uh, and including that uh, within universities, we can do that as well. And my fourth one, final one, is that we can and we must feedback as we go as researchers. There are all sorts of different ways we can do that, whether it's a briefing meeting, using a slide set, a webinar, a phone call. There are different ways we can... Um, by feedback as well as our articles and outputs. And yes, we can do those through preprints and all sorts of different ways we've learned in recent months. And my conclusion on this would be, um, I think we've learned we've got to be flexible. We need to be focused. That's really keeping that focus on the research questions. 
and also just be frank and honest about what's possible or not. Again, that was something Trish really picked up. And I think my very final point would be that uh, you have to somehow and be unflappable. I'm not sure we achieved that, but uh, we've, uh, we've certainly tried our best over the past uh, months and to ultimately to try and provide really robust evidence for the users that need it. Thanks, Judith. There's some really great um, lessons there that you've um, shared with us. Definitely uh, food for thought. And one of them um, uh, speaks to a really great one of the questions that's come through um, from Arnie Walters at um, the Health Foundation, uh, who says, who asks about formative evaluation and that um, summative evaluations are often commissioned by government to justify their decisions. Um, he's wondering uh, what the panel thinks is the right balance between formative and summative evaluation, particularly given the current pandemic and pressure on the system going forward. And it also relates to your point about, you know, when is it um, appropriate to share findings and um, uh, the best being the enemy of the good point as well? Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's both and and summative and particularly with the the past year and the experience of evaluation during the pandemic and I think actually um, a good example Naomi would be the work we've done collaboratively on the remote monitoring of COVID symptoms at home um, which again I, say, I keep trailing it don't I <laughs> there's a spoiler alert uh, you're going to talk about later this morning but I think there there's been a first phase of work that has um, um, described the service models, explored what's going on, um, really seeking to understand that approach and how it's working for different people involved in the, in the delivery of that approach to care. But now there's a second phase that's really moving to understand the impact. And, you know, in that sense, the more, the more summative part of it. And I think that balance with studies where, um, yes, we can be we need to be offering those formative, giving the feedback as we go along, particularly as something's being established, if it's quite tentative and working out what works. For. And also, just in a very practical way, how can it be improved? Or perhaps does something need to be stopped because it's not working so well? I think there's a real social responsibility using public money to do this research, to feed that back as we go. But importantly, to be putting in place data collection approaches, protocols, so that we can track the, um, the outcomes longer term, including there as well, I think, a good example would be the remote monitoring one. What, what part of that is going to be relevant for the kind of medium term while we're still dealing with COVID? But actually, what can be learned from that perhaps for other health conditions where people meet, might need monitoring at home if they've got a, a chest infection or a urinary tract infection or something to avoid and going to hospitals. That makes sense. So I think it's that... It's, it's always that having that um, eye on both the short, the medium and the longer term, balancing then the evaluation approach to suit that. Thank you. And if I could bring Mike in there. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts about this balance between formative and summative um, findings, feedback, and um, if that has any challenges for commissioning of research? Um, it, it, it very much does. Uh, so. Um, certainly in all the work I do with um, policymakers around commissioning research, and my first question, well, one of my very early questions is, how will this be used? You know, what, what are the questions that, you'll, that this will help answer in future? How will this actually help you make decisions around future policy direction? Um, and clearly questions around things like formative versus summative come into that. Um, but frankly, there's also the reality of it, you know, if you're having to do something at pace, you're very likely going to be able to do a, a, a summative evaluation. You're going to have to be much more focused on the formative, the process evaluation, not least the sorts of pace we've been working through at the moment. And I think one of the things that, um, again, recent experience has thrown a light on is the reality of decision making, particularly for ministers. It was something that, that Trish mentioned around, you know, um, certainty may never be reached. There's, there's that constant trade off between making a decision now versus waiting an extra few weeks till you get slightly better evidence and, and making the decision then. Um, and so, again, I think this comes right back to the question of what is it you're evaluating for? How are you actually going to use the results? 
that should be driving. Well, how are you going to see these results and when? That should be driving the whole formative versus summative question rather than anything more sort of theoretical. That's great. And it really um, ties in uh, with another great question we've had uh, from Leonora Merritt in Nuffield Trust, um, who says there's clearly been a flurry of interest in rapid evaluation and evidence research more generally since COVID-19. Uh, I'm interested in whether the panel think there is a danger that the more information there is out there, the more that policymakers and others can cherry pick evaluations that suit predetermined agendas. And if so, what can be done about that? So I'll start asking Mike first if you take a crack at that one. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd, I'd completely hold the policymakers cherry picking evidence genuinely with the, the, the work of policymakers that the, the, the genuine aim is to try and understand the evidence and try and get as best a, a picture and the most honest a picture we can to, to minister to help make the decisions. Um, so I think the, the, the cherry picking maybe goes on, doesn't go on in terms of pulling together the options and, and putting the evidence forward. Um, I think the, the most important thing and probably most useful things for, for policymakers, I know my permit secretaries and, and um, uh, Chris Wormald and Chris Whitty wrote a, a paper on this year last year year before last just talking about systematic reviews mm. and how they are the most useful things for policy makers so i think that the best thing a policy yes there is a there's, a there's an opportunity there in terms of there's a lot of evidence out there to actually synthesize it and pull it together in useful ways for policy makers because that's what policy makers want that's what decision makers want they genuinely want a view across the evidence in an understandable digestible way that can help them inform their own decision making, the decision making of others, and I think that's. I think we should, rather than seeing it as a, as a risk of an abundance of research, it's an opportunity um, for people to really pull that together into useful uh, forms for for decision makers. Great, thank you. And Judith, do you have any um, comments on that question? Yeah, um, I, I was also going to make the point about reviews, and in fact, I'd use the word synthesis, and I am. Um, I think it's um, actually a, a really important responsibility for those researchers and leading research teams to either undertake synthesis ourselves of all the evidence that there already is, and that will be, of course, always a growing body of evidence, and to help policymakers, practitioners and others, um, again, partly help them frame the questions that they're asking, because sometimes that's one of the key roles we, we play. People will come to us and ask for an evaluation, but we're helping them to understand what is it you're really trying to do and really trying to understand. We can frame, help them frame their questions, but also critically then help them understand often or just find out for them what other work there already is. Because sometimes the answer is the work may not need doing or not as much of it needs doing because it's already been done before, or we can work out how we can add to that evidence base in the current context. I think that's a critical role for us within rapid evaluation. Great. And that um, the question has come in exactly on that topic. But first of all, um, to share this comment from Charlotte Clay from NHSX, really resonate with your point, Judith, about researchers wanting to be perfectionists. I think this is something I personally have struggled with this past year, having to adapt the way I work and be more pragmatic about the research and evaluation I'm involved in. Thanks, Charlotte, for that reflection. And the, the question from Eileen McDonough from um, Advancing Quality Adva uh, Alliance, um, can you see future growth in meta-evaluation methodology to bring together findings and insights of rapid studies? I can, yes. Um, and I think actually, that's a great question. As I reflect on it, and I have done quite a bit recently, I think another thing that's happened over the last year, I talked about things within the sort of race rapid evaluation team and what we've learned. But I think Naomi and John, you know, we've we've collaborated a lot across our evaluation teams, haven't we? But I think I've noticed a lot, I think more collaboration than usual generally across research groups, uh, across the research foundations and think tanks, because I think we've been working rapidly. We've needed to draw different insights. Um, and perhaps one other example, going back to Trish, who um, set out our thinking so helpfully, well, her thinking for us so helpfully this morning, 
Um, there's a whole group of us who are doing research on different aspects of innovation and transformation in primary care during the pandemic. Trish is leading a major study in that area. Others of us are involved in different uh, projects. But we've come together in quite an organic way to form a network of people undertaking research in that area. Now, I know that's not exactly perhaps as, as grand yet as some sort of analysis, but it is at least a coming together of the researchers to use public money to share our insights and hopefully then be able to present findings to policymakers in a more organised and helpful manner. Thank you. And um, Mike, uh, finally, because we're um, due to wrap up soon, um, but there's, you'll be pleased about um, this comment from Nicola Irvine from the University of Strathclyde, who says, I've had great support from the HRA in improving research rapidly. The changes to the ethical approval process has been outstanding at helping me continue with urgent re uh, care research in non-COVID care. Very impressed by the changes people are willing to consider. So, um, Mike, that's uh, really good to hear. Uh, my sub-question is, can we see that continuing uh, in peacetime, um, please? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the yes, the, the, the response to the system, the response by the system has been absolutely remarkable. I mean, you know, processes that would previously take months. I think there's one example, we had a, a protocol come in on the Thursday. Um, over the following three days, we got all the approvals for everything from funding through to ethics, everything we needed, and it, the first patient was recruited on the Monday. So the system has been absolutely incredible in terms of the speed at which it's gone about things, um, and certainly the streamlining of processes. A lot of the speed that has been able to, a lot of the, the reason we've been able to do things so much quickly is people basically working themselves into a stupor. I mean, the, just the, the hours put in by people I mean, in the front line is incredible, by the sales system is incredible, and the energy that people have put in. Um, so I think we need to do some, a bit of separating out of how much is the sort of genuine learning and what can we apply in the... Um, sort of post COVID, post COVID world, an horrible phrase. Uh, what we can apply that more generally to to learning, um, and also, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do is get reasonable expectations back in from, particularly to people like ministers, so that we we can't operate like this uh, the whole time. It's simply not sustainable. But there is a, I can assure you, there is a lot of work going on. To say, how can we take the best of this? particularly yes. the streamlining and the speeding up, mm. the reduction in bureaucracy, um, and uh, and learn from that and, and make sure that we don't lose that in future. That's very good to hear. And I will squeeze in one more question um, because it's a good one um, uh, from my colleague, John Appleby from the Nuffield Trust. Um, but if you could keep your remarks brief because we need to finish it in a few minutes. So he's interested here from the panel about some of the opportunity costs of the absolutely understandable focus on COVID related research evaluation. I think he means the costs on non COVID research. Mike, do you want? Um, yeah, on well, it's the it's the uh, it's not just research. I mean, it, it's when we look across the health system and, um, you know, uh, the amount of health centers that have then um, paused, stopped um, because of COVID. Um, clearly, there are costs. Um, I think at the time, the decision was absolutely right to focus on uh, where we focused with, with COVID. Um, and you know, there are very live discussions at the moment, particularly around restarting research and restarting an RHR research, um, which again is, is hugely important, something we are very, very uh, hot on and keen that we get things up and running again as soon as we can. Thank you. And Judith, do you have any brief thoughts about the opportunity yeah, costs? I mean, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think any number of us across the health services research community are continuing with other research um, that it, you know, present us directly related to the pandemic. I mentioned the example of mental health for young people in schools. Um, I mentioned about inequalities and access to digital approaches to primary care. They, but I mean, pandemic angle to them, but they are absolutely here um, for the long term. And I say, and I think a lot of research is continuing. And I'd also just um, give real credit to our research commissioners at the National Institute for Health Research and, and indeed other research uh, councils and commissioners, because I think other work is 
being planned and funded. There are calls out for research on uh, all sorts of topics in health and social care at the moment that um, will, are vital. And I think also we'll be critically picking up what has happened because of some of the perhaps delays to other care that have been inevitable during the pandemic, other things that um, have continued to happen as they do in terms of people's health and care needs. So, so I think the balance is there. It may not be, I think we're hearing more about the pandemic related research sometimes, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a whole wealth of health and social care research that, that's underway and that will be vitally important for us in the uh, months and years ahead. That's great. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all three of our speakers, Trish and Mike and Judith, for a really great um, session and uh, to the audience for some fantastic uh, questions. Um, thank you so much. I think we've uh, made a great start uh, to uh, the conference. Uh, we're now uh, just about to start a 10 minute break. So you've got uh, time to get your third or fourth cup of coffee of the morning. Uh, we will restart again at uh, 10.40 um, for the second session, um, uh, which, uh, uh, which has been trailed very nicely in this uh, first one, looking at a particular rapid evaluation. Um, so uh, thank you again to our speakers and for the questions uh, and see you shortly.